Okay, this here is all the way to the southeast side of the Sea of Galilee, in this particular area. We find that uh, when Jesus came, this man came running up. And what, what did he say? The demons were doing the talking through him. Yeah, what did the demons say through the man? Oh, yes, he was the Son of God. Had Jesus already uh, proclaimed this? Had Peter done this? Uh, claimed this at this time, that Jesus was the Son of God? No. This is the first time that someone has claimed that he was the Son of God. And guess who, who makes that declaration? The demons. Evil spirits, as one version says. Uh, and so we find that the spirits from the other world that know God, know Jesus, are the ones who immediately recognize Him and who He was. And they come to Him because they know they're in trouble. And uh, so they recognized Him as first of all as the Son of God. What else did they recognize about Him? He had power. He had power. And it wasn't just power because they knew that He could make something happen, but He had the authority to make that power happen. What did the Bible say that uh, that they did? Uh, first of all, well, wait a minute, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Not too much, but the man himself, first of all, he was uh, basically running around without clothes, wild, couldn't be restrained, couldn't be chained. So this, everybody knew him, okay? Everybody in that region recognized him. They tried to restrain him. They tried to dress him up. They tried to clean him up. They tried to protect him from himself. Because the Bible says he tried to hurt himself. And they tried to do all these things, and basically they determined it was a lost cause. So that's important because when the people are going to see a transformation in life, it's going to be significant. Okay? Now, about the demon, as we was talking about, he recognized Jesus as the Son of God. He recognized his power and his authority to inflict torture. Right? Because he said, please don't torture me. Don't inflict things on me. Alright? Uh, he also, what did the demon cause this man to do? Physically. When he came to Jesus. Bow down. He came down on his knees and he bowed down to Jesus. He recognized that he had authority. He was the Son of God and he bows down to him and begs for mercy. All this goes in line with the fact that he knows exactly who he is. Jesus asked who this demon or this evil spirit is, and what was the reply? What was his name? Legion. He says the reason we're called Legion is we're really not one, even though he was speaking as one, we're really many. Okay? So there were many, many there, and so his name was Legion. Does anybody know what a Legion is? 6,000 Roman soldiers. It's a specific group of military formation made up of 6,000 people. Now, it's not saying there were 6,000 uh, demons here. It's not saying there were, you know, it couldn't be 6,001. It wasn't saying there was five, couldn't be 5,999. The point was there were many, which is exactly what he said. Many, 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 many. So when you think of legion, it's a lot. As a matter of fact, when the Jews or the People of the garrison saw a legion coming at them. What they do? Get away! Because when a, a Roman legion started coming to town, that was not good. So we see this. So they recognized that. All right. So he's named Legion because there were many, many of these evil spirits within this man. Not just the one, but many. All right. So after he bows down and everything, Jesus makes a command. What's he command of these spirits to do? Come out to leave. To come out and leave. And the, the text tells us that they begged not to be sent away. But if you look at uh, Luke chapter 8, it says where the away is. Anybody know where that is? Into the abyss. Luke uh, chapter 8 tells them that not to be sent away from there and be placed in the abyss. Now, we don't know a lot about the abyss. It's referenced a few times, primarily in Revelation. But the abyss is a place where what takes place? Eternal punishment will be there. But until then, it's a place 
where they are actually uh, uh, demons are restrained. They cannot, be, they cannot be free. As a matter of fact, Revelation talks about God having an angel that actually holds, controls the key, whether to let them out or not. And so, it's a place in the spiritual world of imprisonment of uh, the uh, spiritual forces that uh, we don't know a whole lot about that are in opposition to God. Okay? So basically he's saying, please don't put me into, into prison, eternal prison. Don't put me in this place, the abyss, the place that Satan is bound for, the place that uh, he will live for eternity, this place that was placed for them for eternity. So it says, please don't send me there. Instead, they ask an unusual request. And they asked to be cast out of the man. Okay, we're going to do what you say, but get, do me a favor. Send me here. Where did he has to be sent? Into the pigs. Why? I don't know. That's my answer. I don't know. <laughs> and I have thought, and I have thought, and I have thought, and I've heard different people say different things. I really don't know. Right. So, so where the spiritual are That's Maybe uh, they didn't realize what the pigs were going to do. Maybe Jesus said, sure, go right ahead. And down to the ocean they went, or the sea they went. Not really sure. It doesn't really say. The point of the whole thing, I think, is this. It's not about, about the pigs. It's about Jesus' power. The recognition of his authority. The recognition of who he was. That before all of physical man... God, uh, the spiritual realm, recognized him in front of the physical realm. I guess the best way to say it. And that's really the significance of trying to do this and, and to explain. Why put them in the pigs? Don't know. The Bible just says they did it. And they drowned. Now, the next thing we'll look at is, okay, so here's what the demons have now left him. What did the people do? What did the people do? First of all, they hear something's happening, right? They get a message that something's happening over on the seaside, and so they come racing up there to see what's going on. When they arrive, what do they find? Pigs. No pigs. <laughs> Their livelihood is gone, and this wild man is sitting there dressed and tamed and eating and talking and having a regular conversation. Loving. And floating big, you know, <laughs> a big bottle, kind of float. <laughs> whatever. And so uh, they look at this, and they see these two things, and they say, you know, and when they look at this, the eyewitnesses, the people that were watching over the pigs, give them a report, and they tell them exactly what happens. And they are here, and they look at it, and uh, they see this man, they see the drowned pigs. Do you think they believe? The, me the message that they were given? I didn't say around long enough to hear message true. No, I mean the, the message that what God had done here, what Jesus had done. I believe they did. The Bible says they were afraid. You're not afraid unless you think it's real. I think they looked at this and they saw what had happened and they were afraid. They believed 100%. And I think this is a good lesson to us. There's a difference between belief and faith. Because they believed, but what did they do? They said, please leave. <laughs> Get away from us. Okay? So they wanted them to do. So when we look at this, there's two responses that take place to this event. First of all, the people. When we look at all these people, their response was to what Jesus had done to them and in their community. And they saw his power. They heard that he was recognized as the Son of God. They heard all these things. First hand, they believed enough that they were so afraid, and their response was, go away. I don't want any of this. On the other hand, the man who, the, who was, had these demons, and it actually occurred to him, what was his response? Let me go with you. And when Jesus said, no, 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 that's not, that's not your place in life. Instead, do what? Stay and go tell everybody. Guess what the man did? Exactly that. And he told so many people, people, the story was told so many times, the Bible says that they were amazed. So you've got this event where God comes in, in 
to a community. He causes an action to take place. He demonstrates that he is not only has all authority, he has all power, he is the Son of God. The spiritual world recognizes that. He does all these things, and then two, one of two things happens. Either the people reject him outright and say, we don't want any of that, or the people say, we want it. Why did the people not want it? Because what had it done? Took away the took away their livelihood. It took away their comfort level. They took away what they had. Why did the man who had this evil spirits want Jesus and, and accept Him? It made Him better. That's something we need to think about because a lot of times, isn't that true? That when, however the message of Jesus affect, hits a person, is it going to make them better in the physical sense or not? And a lot of times, that's the way people receive receive the message. Is it going to make it be better or worse? And then they react accordingly. Yes. Question: When the um, when when demons were in the slime, they went over the edge of the water. What happened to the demons? Well, as John pointed out, I think they went. Did they go to the abyss? Uh, does not say. Did they not? Ultimately, that's where they're going to go. They either uh, the people die, the spirits are those. I mean, the pigs died, but the spirits don't. But that doesn't mean that after they depart the pigs, they got to go somewhere, so... Uh, spirit world, though. This is a physical death, spiritual death. Those are two different things. Physical life, spiritual life, two different things. Sometimes they come together, but they're actually two separate events. Okay, so when we look at this, this gives us a basic example of how things are. And I've come up with a couple other examples I want us to touch base and look at that Jesus did. First of all, right before G after Jesus came triumphant into this into the uh, into Jerusalem, and he comes into the temple, what is the thing what does he find there? The money changers. The money changers. We find the money changers sitting there selling out uh, selling things, trying to make money off of God in essence. And what does Jesus do? He turns the tables, turns the tables and throws them out and says Quit making this a den of robbers. It wasn't so much that they were selling out. First of all, they were in the temple. They should have been outside. But it wasn't so much that they were providing uh, a needed sacrifice, but they were robbers. They were, they were taking advantage. They were profiteering for God in his house. And he pretty much throws them out. And he goes on to tell us, and this uh, incidentally one example is in Luke 19, verses 45 through 48. Uh, it says that the chief priest and talks about them. Well, who run the temple? Chief priests made up of which group of people? Levites. Sadducees, Levites. They were the ones who were primarily uh, behind Jesus' death. Why? What did they want to stay the same? Their prophets and their control, their status quo with Rome. As long as Rome was happy, they were able to keep raking in the dough. They were profiting. Who do you think these guys in this den of robbers were actually working for? Satan. Very good. All right, on earth. Satan's agent. Who's Satan's agent? These Sadducees, these leaders. That's who they work for. You don't get a permit from the office of the, of the temple. To work in the temple without the priest and the high priest and all them uh, and these leaders allowing it. They were profiting off of this. So the Bible says after this, they sought a way to kill Jesus. Reaction? When they were presented with Christ, figure out a way to get rid of him because what was it interfering with? Their physical comfort, their physical livelihood. Next example. Jesus talks about a rich fool in Luke chapter 12. The man was blessed. Many, many crops. And he had so much crops, he didn't know what to do with them or whatever. So he said, I'm going to tear down my barns and build a big one. You know? I never really did understand that. I don't understand why he just didn't build one next to it. I mean, we had a church building there. We got too big. We built a bigger one and then a bigger one. You know, you go all over Nashville and they got three of them. They, you know, and most farmers are not going to tear down a barn no matter how old it is and how it leaks. A patch it. But they build another one. That's neither here nor there. The point was, he says, I'm going to build a bigger one so I can keep harvest, uh, capture this harvest. For what purpose? 
for himself in order to prepare for the future, in order that he would be comfortable in all things in the future. Therefore, he could sit back and say, eat, drink, and be merry. I got it all made. I'm all comfortable. The Bible says that, you, that God took, uh, took his life that day and, and said the reason he took it was because why? Did he build a bigger barn? Trusting himself? Pretty much. That's where it's you know, basically going. He says, I was not, he was not rich toward God. God had blessed him. First of all, he forgot where he got the blessings. He thought he did it. Second of all, uh, instead of trusting that God would provide more tomorrow, he decided to hoard it all up today to take care of it so he didn't have to do anything else the rest of his life. And he wasn't rich toward God. So it wasn't so much about the possessions that God had given him, it was about his response to them. And once again, the penalty for this, the problem with this, was the blessings that he had got in the way. They got in the way. Third example. <clears throat> Actually, that wasn't third example. No, that was second example. Third example. Did I say that was in Luke 18? Or Luke 12? Okay, good. I'm get ahead of myself. The next example is found in Luke 18. It's the rich young man. The rich young man comes to Jesus and says, Hey, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Worthy goal. He's not looking for today. He's looking for eternal life. Incidentally, that's what Jesus had been going around teaching and talking about, so that was an obvious question to ask. Okay, what do I got to do to get it? As a matter of fact, I've been a good Pharisee. Everything he said he did was just like a Pharisee. I'm not saying he was. But he was a good Jew. Jew. Okay? Followed the law from his youth up. Good Jew. Did all those things that he's supposed to do. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what did Jesus say? Sell everything and follow Jesus. Why? Wanted him to be broke? No. What he trusted on. Because you see, if he got rid of everything he had, then it would be about what Jesus did. His question was, and when he came to Jesus, is what must I do? I have followed all the commandments. I have accomplished all these things. I have done all these things. What do I need to do? And Jesus said, stop being you. Stop looking at you. Get rid of everything you are and let me do it. And the quickest way to do that was take away what made him confident, which was money. Any of you ever had a time when you were almost broke or you felt like you just couldn't make it hardly very much farther? I have. When you do that, don't you feel like somebody else has got to take care of you because I'm not doing it? Do you like that feeling? I don't. That's what he's trying to say. That's the feeling. That's what it needs to be. It's dependent upon him and what worried about. Okay? As a matter of fact, there are many, many other examples, and I was trying to find one in the Old Testament, and none, none hit me in the head, but if you go through time and time again, you will find, in most cases, the reason people reject God because it gets in the way of me and what I want in this world. Not, not every time, but almost every time you will find it. Go through it. There's case after case after case. And then look at the, all around us in this world, you know, this time of history. You see the same thing. All right? Uh, some of his teachings. In this same lesson with the rich young uh, ruler, Later on, at the very end of the conversation, he starts talking about the rewards because Peter and them start saying, oh, well, I left everything. What do I get? What do I get? What do I get? He basically says, yeah, the future is in heaven. But then he finishes it up, and it's not in the uh, Luke account, but it is in the Mark and in the Matthew account. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, in Matthew 19, verse 30, and Mark 10, verse 31, he says, Many who are first will be last. I like uh, Mark's account. I mean, yeah, Mark's account because it doesn't get into all the rest. 
you know, into another lesson. But what he says is he says, many who are first will be last. And he stops right there. You know, we always think about, oh, if you're last, you'll be first, you know. Well, actually, if you go to Matthew's account, he adds that. Luke's account doesn't include either one. But in Mark's account, he says, the one who is first will be last in many cases. That's a warning. Because the one, just like this rich young ruler who wanted to be first, religiously, first, well, first, confidence, first, you know, it was all about being first, and instead, he went away sorrowful. How is he going to end up first? No, he's going to end up last. And then you look at Matthew's account, and he says, and also, the last will be first. So there's kind of a flip-flop there. Which is not what the world teaches. The world teaches if you're going to be first, where you got to be? Strive to be number one. You never strive to be last. You know? If you're going to be last in the world, guess what? You're going to be a loser. You know, that's what they teach. Yes, sir. Go ahead with, the, with what brings up came from this. You what? I need my stone. This man went. Well, I gotta work, or I'm tired. 
I've been working all day and all night. I've got to go to school. I've got to get my kids here. I've got to do that. You know, we've got football practice next week. Or whatever it is. I don't know. We all figure all those obligations out. We've got a list 100 miles long. It never ends, folks. He's saying that. It's a physical obligation, and we're all going to die, and it won't really matter in the end. What really does matter is the priority. Put him first. All right? The next thing he says is uh, there's no going back. You going to follow him? Okay. Let's go. You know? He gives the example of the guy who says, well, let me go home and tell my family goodbye and, you know, make some, get everything all situated for them so everything's comfortable they take care of. He's the thing Jesus is basically saying, that's not what's important. Follow me. So there's a cost involved in following Jesus. And he makes it clear. Sometimes when we teach Christians, we convert Christians, we fail to mention that. And then we find a month later, where are they? They realize it's a cost. And the cost, they're not willing to give up. They're not willing to. So sometimes we need to make sure that they understand that there is a cost involved. And the last teaching related to this that I want us to bring out is Jesus said the greatest commandment is to Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, all those things. That's the greatest commandment. The second one is like unto it. It is to love your neighbor. Upon these two laws hang all laws, all problems. You want to know what's right and wrong? There's two right there. Determine, does it have anything to do with loving God or not? Have anything to do with loving your man, fellow man, or not? If it's, if it's an opposition to those two, it's a sin. He says, so there's priorities. Love God. Number one, greatest commandment. Second, love fellow man. Wait a minute, where does man fit in on that? What's Paul say in Philippians chapter 2? Consider others better than yourselves. Take the attitude of Christ Jesus. He makes it very clear that that's it. Matter of fact, in Galatians 2, 20, he tells us what? We are crucified with Christ. But we live. How do we live? With Christ. So the reality is, the minute we decide to be buried with Christ, we are raised to live as Christ, not as Scott. And that means by making a choice to put God as a priority and our fellow man is right behind it. As a matter of fact, he even gives us a, an illustration of that about the guy that comes to the, to the banquet table. The guy that sits at the end of the table and sits in a lovely position. The master will ask him to sit up at the, move up to the head table. The guy that walks in and says, I'm going up the head table. He says, uh, excuse me, you need to go sit by the door. That's what God's trying to say. That's not what man teaches. It's in direct opposition to what the man world says. Okay? What does that got to do with us? All right? Practical, some practical applications. First thing I want us to get out of this is first. Every example we looked at of uh, the people they chose comfort in today over comfort for eternity. When we look at material blessings, uh, we look at how materialism causes a misplaced priority, I guess is what I'm trying to say. When we look at that, how materialism is a major cause of messing up our priorities here, every one of them we looked at here, we find that they chose today's comfort over eternity's comfort. We've talked about that many times in this class over the years. How we always, man has a tendency to always rather have $100 now than rather than a chance, as he said, <coughs> on $1,000 are you 10 years from now. You know, because he thinks he can do more with 100 today than worry about whether he gets a, that to happen there. And so man basically perceives today, those are the physical and those kind of things. It's man, in man's nature to do that. Uh, and when we look at this, every example showed us that material caused these priorities to be out of kilter because it produced self-sufficiency, produced confidence in myself which automatically has a tendency to go reducing the need for faith or trust in God. It moves that. The largest weapon that Satan uses in our country today is what? Alcohol. 
Our wealth, richest country in the world, our wealth, our affluence. As this country has grown more wealthy and more powerful, how much closer have we got to God? Exact opposite. As our wealth and influence has gained, dependence upon God has declined. They're opposites. They go that way. You look at ours. Our comfort uh, in this country becomes a priority and starts excluding God to the point that now less than half uh, in this country here a few months ago uh, claim to be Christian anymore. Uh, Christianity, like Judaism, just like those Jews at that day, people start losing their faith even though they claim to be a Jew. Even though we claim today to be Christians, we start losing our faith, our trust, our dependence upon Him as things start happening to us and we start getting the well. Who do you think is doing that? Satan doesn't have to convince us that God is bad and Satan is good. <clears throat> All he has to do is divide us and cause us to misplace our priorities by sometimes giving us things that we really uh, don't uh, handle well. And he knows it will lure us away by, I think James calls it, the desires of our heart. Uh, our inward desires. So we need to be careful of that. Next thing. Mankind, we, react to Jesus based on not how he affects others, but how he affects us. I've seen this over and over again in Cuba and everywhere else in this country. You can look around, and it's really dependent upon the person. If the person is down and out and needs something, and God provides it, they go racing and telling the world about it, what he's done. If they have it all and they don't need it, they have a tendency to push it away and say, let me alone. That's why it's, the church is growing faster in Cuba than it is in the United States. That's why it's growing in other countries that have needs. They're not self-sufficient. They're not have all these material things to get in their way. That's why the church actually grew faster in the first century. It was not because it went to the rich people. Where did the church primarily come from? Those that needed things. Those that followed Jesus were people who needed things. You know, sometimes it was comfort. Sometimes it was blessing. Sometimes it was help. Sometimes it was just love and caring. Knowing somebody out there cared because their leaders didn't. Uh, Next thing, we must consider others better than ourselves, like I mentioned in Philippians 2. All commands are based on loving God and man. And Matthew 25 makes it very clear that our love for God is demonstrated how? How we treat, how we treat our fellow man. If you want to be a sheep, you better be treating God's people, not just God's people, you need to be treating mankind as Jesus did. We need to be treating them with care and love. It doesn't matter who they are. Unless you don't care and you want to be a goat, go right ahead. That's basically what Jesus was telling us. Um, Matthew 25 finishes off by saying that to the sheep, to those who love God's people, uh, love mankind and did things for his fellow man, they would have eternal comfort. Those that took it and kept everything for themselves and didn't look out for their fellow man, they would have eternal punishment. So you can trade comfort today for punishment tomorrow, or you can take punishment today or misery today for comfort tomorrow, which is better. We've got to have God's perspective or an eternal perspective in order to see the correct way to live. And the last thing is this. Philippians chapter 2. But midway through it, after it talks about Jesus coming and humbling himself, becoming a servant, you know, this is the attitude he's telling us to be like, and doing all these things, it says that God raised him up and placed him at the right hand of God. And at the name of Jesus, who will bow? Every knee. What did these demons do? Down on their knees. They all recognize exactly who he is. Paul tells us very clearly there will be a time when every knee, whether they be uh, human, spiritual beings, doesn't matter, angelic beings, whatever, 
All knees will bow before Jesus. All will bow before Him. Christians are going to do this because they're going to recognize what God has done for them and what He's given them. They're going to recognize His grace. They'll gladly fall at their knees. <laughs> Those who are not Christians, they're going to fall at His knees too. But it's going to be because of one of two things. One, they're forced at their knees. Or two, they're going to be begging for mercy. Either way, that eternal punishment is still coming. I think of the the uh, time, the movies and whatever where the, the military forces somebody down to bow or whatever. And, and I, I see that as those that are rebellious and like Satan and those of his, God's going to, they'll be forced to their knees to recognize that God is the power. I think that God's awesome power. I think from what we see that we are that we are shielded from it. Even those that, that he loves are shielded from it. That when we see his power and his glory and full of alchemy might be forced to pray or just be nobody will be able to say that. Okay, which is not able to say that. Well, I think that will force them to do it. That's what I'm, what I'm getting at. But either way, the bottom line is, every knee will bow. And Satan and Satan's servants who were here at this particular time demonstrated to all those people, it's recorded, demonstrated that very case. Not just what Paul said, but we got an example where that actually took place all of a sudden. All right, any other questions, thoughts, comments? Next week we'll take a look at lesson number four. Lesson number four is still the boy down the street.